Good morning. In this video, I would like to talk about sampling techniques in qualitative research. I would like to begin with how uh, quantitative researchers worry about and what qualitative researchers worry about. So quantitative researchers worry about, I want to know what causes something else. I really spend a lot of time wondering how to measure things. I wonder how small patterns generalize to big patterns. I want to make sure others can repeat my findings. So the aim of the quantitative research is to measure something and make sure that the findings are generalizable to the population. Qualitative researchers worry about, I want to see the world through the eyes of my respondent. I want to describe the context in a lot of detail. I want to show how social change occurs. I'm interested in how things come to be. I really want my research approach to be flexible and able to change. So the aim of the qualitative research is to understand from within the subjective reality of the study participants. So there are two types of sampling methods. So you see here probability sampling and the second called non-probability sampling. As you see in the slide, probability sampling involves random selection. It means that every member of the population has a chance of being selected. By doing this, you can make statistical inferences about the whole group. If you want to produce results that are representative of the whole population, you need to use a probability sampling technique. The second one is non-probability sampling. This involves non-random selection based on convenience or other criteria, allowing you to easily collect initial data. So there are assumptions of quantitative sampling and qualitative sampling, and both are different. So in qualitative sampling, the assumptions are, we want to generalize to the population. Random events are predictable. We can compare random events to our results. If you have this three assumption, then what you need is probability sampling. Yeah. And then there are also assumptions of qualitative sampling. They are social actors are not predictable like objects. Randomized events are relevant to social life. Probability sampling is expensive and inefficient. If you have this assumption, you may go to non-probability sampling. So, um, in a previous slide, I would like to go previous slide again. I would like to say, in quantitative sampling, what you need is probability sampling. In qualitative sampling, what you need is non-probability sampling. So, when we are talking about qualitative sampling, yeah, the question of how many. You see, I've been asked this question so many times by my students. How many participants do I need for my study? When you are doing qualitative research, you don't need this question because qualitative researchers seek saturation. How many is not really the issue. What the issues are, do you understand the phenomenon? Have you learned enough? So numbers are irrelevant. What you need is deep understanding. Yeah. It is different from quantitative researchers who seek for statistical validity. They think about can you safely generalize to the population? Have you systematically excluded anyone? So this is what they worry about. So doing sampling in qualitative research, the term of how many is not really the easy. But I would like to go back again to the uh, qualitative, sorry, quantitative uh, sampling. Um, in this case, probability sample. Yeah, there are four mind types. So you see in your slide, there are simple random sample, systematic sample, stratified sample, and cluster sample. The key benefit of probability sampling method is that they guarantee that the sample chosen is representative of the population. This thing you, need, you don't need to worry about when you are doing qualitative research. So in qualitative research or non-probability sampling that you use when you are doing qualitative research, there are several types. Propulsive sampling, convenient sampling, snowball sampling, and quota sampling. Qualitative researchers typically make sampling choices that enable them to deepen understanding of whatever phenomena it is that they are studying. So you see, I would like to explain from the beginning. Uh, the first one is propulsive sampling. Yeah. 
uh, the meaning. Um, you see, in your slide, purposeful sampling, also known as purposive and selective sampling, yeah. Uh, this sampling technique is a sampling that qualitative researchers use to recruit participants who can provide in-depth and detailed information about the phenomenon under investigation. It is highly subjective, I know, and determined by the qualitative researchers generating the qualifying criteria each participant must meet to be considered for the research study. Means that the researchers, uh, you know, determine the criteria who needs to be selected as the sample. So I would like to talk about the example of purposive sampling. An example of this would be a student who seeks to look at the current nurse's perception of leadership style within a specific hospital setting. This one sentence description alone can already generate two selection criteria. A. Must be an active nurse and B. Must work at a specific hospital setting. Additional criteria such as number of years in the field or level of nursing education will ensure participants have a similar foundation. The next type of sampling is convenient samples. Yeah? In convenient sampling, well, this is a sampling technique that qualitative researchers use to recruit participants who are easily accessible and convenient to the researchers. Oftentimes, this may include utilizing geographic location and resources that make participant recruitment convenience. Yeah? Convenience samples. I would like to give you an example here. Yeah, the example would be a teacher who wanted to examine the perception of teachers about a policy change and decided to utilize the school within the district he or she worked in to recruit participants. Another example would be a professional who is a member of a professional organization and wanted to recruit participants through contact information available to members of that organization. So you see, both example would be convenient to each researchers, but also require obtaining permission to recruit participants yeah, from the district and professional organization respectively. Snowball sampling, this is the next technique. Yeah. I think you understand what snowball sampling from the name. This is a sampling technique in which existing subjects provide reveals to recruit samples required for a research study. It is used where potential participants are hard to find. It's called snowball sampling because, in theory, once you have the ball rolling, it picks up more snow along the way and becomes larger and larger. As sample members are not selected from a sampling frame, snowball samples are subject to numerous biases. However, the chain referral process allows the researchers to reach populations that are difficult to sample when using other sampling methods. So let's see um, an example of snowball sampling. A researcher is studying the homeless in a city. Yeah. It is obviously difficult to find a list of all the details of the number of homeless there. However, it is possible to identify one or two homeless individuals who are willing to participate in his study. Now, these homeless individuals provide him with the details of other homeless individuals they know. The first homeless individual that he found for his research is the primary data. He can collect the information and tabulate data from the primary data source and move on to other individuals who the primary data source has referred to. As a researcher, he continues to tap as many homeless he can find through the reference provided till he knows he has collected enough data for his research. The next is, um, let's see, oh, quota sampling. So as what you can see in the slide, quota sampling is a non-probability sampling technique wherein the assembled sample has the same proportion of individual as the entire population with respect to non-characteristic traits or focus phenomena. So you see, um, there are several steps of doing quota sampling. Okay. All right. There are four types, actually. The first, divide the sample population into subgroups. In your slide, you will see this should be mutually exclusive. Yeah, the subgroup should be mutually exclusive, meaning that participants in the study only belong to one strata. For example, 
you might define a certain student population by their professional degree courses such as engineering, arts, humanities, and medicine, or the number of years they've worked at your company, if it is about employee. Yeah. Um, the second one is figure out the weightage of subgroups. Yeah. Um, the researcher must identify the proportion of this subgroup in the population. Yeah, this same proportion will be applied in the sampling process. Let's take a look. For example, in the population, you figure out that there are 25% engineering students, 30% humanities students, 15% art students, and 30% medicine students. So when you're trying to get samples out of this population, you will maintain this proportion in your sample. Thus, you will have 25% for engineering student, 30% 30, 30 for humanities student, 15% for art student, and 30% for students specializing in medicine. After you have these subgroups, yeah, then you select an appropriate sample size. The quota size should be representative of the collective subgroup population. For example, you can select a total sample of 500 students from a population of 5,000 students. So it is one tenth. Yeah? Um, let's see. The last step is survey while adhering to the subgroup population proportion. In our example, yeah, survey engineering students until you reach the specified weight stage, that is 25% of the 500 or um, 125 students. Yeah. So continue with this process until all qu the quotas are filled and 500 students have been surveyed. So this is quota sampling uh, steps. Mm -hmm. uh, the advantages of quota sampling, it's this relatively easy to administer, can be performed quickly, cost-effective, accounts for population proportion, and a useful method when probability sampling techniques are not possible. Yeah. These advantages of quota samples, it may appear that this type of sampling technique is totally representative of the population. In some cases, it is not. Keep in mind that only the selected traits of the population were taken into account in forming the subgroups. In the process of sampling these subgroups, other traits in the sample may be overrepresented. In a study that considered gender, socioeconomic status, and religion as the basis of the subgroups, the final sample may have skewed representation of age, race, educational attainment, marital status, and a lot more. So, um, I think that's all the explanation or the presentation of uh, sampling techniques in qualitative research. I believe this video is not perfect. But I really hope this helped you understand more about what sampling techniques needed when you are doing quantitative research. I think that's all. Thank you for watching.